So, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming before dinner. I really have to emphasize that. Thank you so much for coming. So today we're going to talk about training and education for the new realities of privacy and security. So why are we here? To learn how to, we want to learn how to provide better security education to our peers, and we want to avoid a lot of pitfalls that have caused issues, not only in the past, but, well, also now. So, and again, this is why we're really here. We have a lot to give, not enough time in the day to do it. Seriously, even though Willy Wonka says we're doing th other things. So we have five key challenges. We have no time to train. We have a lot of emerging threats. We get a lot of conflicting info from news media. We think differently, and we have to deal with a lot of scam ads. So I highlight the scam ads. Why? Because every time I go on a web page for anything reputable, this is what I see at the bottom. Millions of people click on these every day. So that's a major challenge for us. Why is that a major challenge? Simply because they're clicking, they think it's true. So we have to talk about what are the factors that affect our ability to effectively communicate. First of all, again, a little time to train, emerging threats, and the inappropriate, incomplete, and conflicting info from the news media, especially when they hype stories and cause undue fear. So give a perfect example of that. I had to write some internal communications on the Baltimore ransomware attack for our team at work to talk about what really happened. This is not the first time some of the recipients of this communication are sitting in this audience. Because what happens is they put these articles out there, they cause complete and utter panic with some members of our senior leadership team, which I hear about from my boss. So news media is not our friend because they're hyping things up and causing a lot of fear. And I will talk about something I had to deal with, not at my current employer, but at my previous one. There's a fear of giving users advice about what to do at home or in their personal lives. Five years ago, I had this complete presentation prepared on the target breach, what to do, how to act, what to do if you were affected, who to contact at your bank. What ended up happening is C-Suite killed it because they didn't want to be liable if so, for telling people what to do on, on their home. They were fearful of the risk. But the truth is, is they need to understand, people are coming to us because we know what we're talking about. And they don't. And so what happens is they find alternate means, which leads us to Taboola, Outbrain, Scam Ads, what you find at the bottom of every web page. And also, and I'm going to call out security vendors for this one, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The amount of which I get on a daily basis, my favorite being two weeks ago, a friend of mine who's a CISO of a hospital system up in Boston, Massachusetts, he refused to take a meeting with a vendor on a product, and the guy signs off, goes, yeah, good luck getting hacked. That's horrible. We need to do better as a security community. And IU Health has the stance, you do anything with fear, uncertainty, and doubt, we will show you the door, period. And I will tell you, the first time I said that was about two and a half years ago at InSpin. I said that, and a vendor walked out of the room. Good, I didn't want their business anyway. So we talk about silver billet syndrome a lot. So we have an issue with companies trying to sell us panaceas for all known risks. That's a major issue because our C-suite gets that. And this actually has a tie back to what they teach in business school. A little bit of background, I got my MBA. The whole reason I got my MBA was to be able to talk to my peers and talk to my old boss, all of whom had MBAs. So the executive teams at IS these days are mostly MBAs. So one thing I learned about being an MBA, from my MBA program is a little thing called technical core theory. They teach that in an organizational theory and design class. And what it basically means is that they tell people, if it's not a core competency of your company making money, to pay minimal attention to it or outsource it. So what ends up happening? They don't do risk analysis. They don't care. 
they minimize it and it, they make it go away because it doesn't involve making money or the core business. Why? Because that's what they teach. And also, people not understanding regulations. This is especially challenging since a lot of them are onerous, a lot of people, they need guides. And there's also, honestly, a lot of sarcasm and insincerity we have to deal with as well. So we have to deal with very suspicious people in the workforce. So I'll give a perfect example of this, HIPAA, or as I like to call it, the gigantic elephant in the room that no one knows what you're talking about and a bunch of security consultancies say they do when they really don't. I look at it as a harbinger because of HIPAA's a problem. Then if you take a look at some of the financial regulations or GDPR, my God, they're 10 times worse than HIPAA. So we also have to deal with bad management that honestly is suspicious of information security. And a lot of know-it-all doomsayers, especially in the security field. Again, one of my favorite things I saw on social media a couple weeks ago was a thought leader saying that Cyber 9-11 was coming. <laughs> and I will tell you that myself and a group of my peers had a lot of fun at that guy's expense. Although I didn't tell the guy his photo made him look like a total idiot online. But again, this is what we deal with on a daily basis. And again, there's been also a general trend in society that we also deal with. This is also a background for a lot of the work we do. That the, there's a general idea that the establishment is holding back cures or solutions for many common problems. So the biggest manifestation that we see these days is with the anti-vaxxer crowd that unfortunately has taken root on social media and caused significant issues. So a lot of snake oil solution sellers out there take advantage of this to sell solutions that don't work because they'll come out and say, oh, the NSA put this out there, but we have X people from there too. And if you buy this, we'll give you the cure. And I'm gonna give a more relevant example that happened in the past week. So any of you have familiar with what MMS is? Miracle Mineral Solution? There is a pastor, unfortunately based out of Willingboro, New Jersey, who has been selling industrial bleach to people in Uganda under the guise of his church, telling them it cures cancer, autism, and HIV. HIV in the sub-Saharan sub sub -Saharan continent has been an epidemic that has killed hundreds of millions of people. We haven't heard much about it here, but again, pushing that, this medication causes internal bleeding and in many cases, death. But because these people, and what his pastor has done is he said that the, that the company, that the big farm is holding this back to make billions of dollars, tens of thousands of people in sub-Saharan Africa believe him, people are dying over this. And what's happening here is that there are private Facebook groups that are saying the same thing. And they're talking about how to hide the use of MMS from child protective services. So that is the mindset we have to deal with now. We have a major problem here, which is, a, again, we keep this in mind. We develop our training programs. And we talk a lot about helpful coworkers, and by helpful, I mean helpful by giving bad advice, and helpful by trying to help you and looking up things they shouldn't, such as medical records or your personal information. We've had a significant revamp of our training program because of people looking at these two things when they shouldn't. And that's all I can legally say about that. So we've had a bad history as well with taking down or belittling people or confusing them. So I came into IU Health about three years ago. I had to deal with the fact that I fired a raging asshole who the customers hated. And I'm not kidding when I say this. I spent the first six weeks of my job fielding customer complaints. And that kind of attitude. Now, when I get, that, when I get someone reporting this kind of attitude and they're one of our attorneys, it turns into a big problem. This has been the kind of problem I've had to deal with many times in the past. And also, this is how a lot of people perceive information security. So this is what we're trying to avoid. I could click on this, but I think everyone's seen this video probably 10 times over. 
whether we like it or not in our Facebook feeds or social media feeds, oftentimes auto-playing and eating up our data plan. So let me get, this one's better. This is the other kind of bad security we're trying to avoid, which is security that looks good but really doesn't do anything. Kind of like Mackin, always sunny in Philadelphia. So let's move on with what we have to deal with. One is training. How do we view it? It's a continual set of processes that exist between our team and the workforce to facilitate trust, credibility, and two-way communication on issues that arise. We want people calling us. We want to educate and enlighten our workforce so we can better respond to emerging threats. We want to help our team members make better decisions regarding their personal use of computers, mobile devices, and the internets. And we want to get better feedback using well-designed QA instruments and good customer communication. Because when you do this right, you respect the, and respect the culture, mission, and values of your organization, realistically, you get better tie-ins from your customers, and that's what's most important. So this is what training isn't. No fear, uncertainty, and doubt, none whatsoever. You don't scare your users, and you don't buy it unless you absolutely have to. In my organization, what I found when dealing with a lot of my customers, it's considered a sign of disrespect to buy the training because it means that you don't take the effort to meet the customer's needs. And they also consider it being cheap and that you're not listening to the customer needs. I mean, it's, they make it very clear to you when you talk to them that if it comes from outside, they don't want it. And you don't threaten people with fines or penalties or the OCR. No, you really don't do that, especially our senior leadership team. And you don't threaten people with job loss or suspensions. I mean, that's not good. That's an adversary relationship. And quite frankly, it doesn't work. And also, it's not about big egos or self-appointed leaders telling people what they should do and how they should change. And if you really want to turn people off, you do that. When you really want to upset everyone, you reach out to other parts of your management team and tell them, your security team's doing wrong, they should hire your company instead. So I give an example from a Linux community. I talk about this sometimes. It's when the GNOME project put out GNOME 3 a few years ago. And they put out a tutorial that was, I consider, one of the most condescending tutorials I ever saw on spatial navigation. It was condescending, saying, you're navigating wrong. No, you should be doing it this way. You've been doing it all wrong in the past. Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Almost every major Linux distribution of consequence switched to another windowing product called Mate. Why? Because of the, the attitude of the GNOME team. And realistically, they've never recovered from that and actually set back Linux on the desktop quite significantly because of the condescending attitudes that the GNOME developers had. So what are our goals of training? We want people to get from unknown to known quickly. We use sentences with 10 to 12 words maximum. Thanks, Dr. Geddes, Temple University. We tie back to our mission and values. We tie back to how to protect the mission and values on our patients. We tell the truth. We don't embellish. And one thing I have to caution people about, don't talk about how you got there or talk about your machinations, because a lot of people honestly don't care about that. So how do your customers think? They don't think the same way you do, because realistically, a lot of our customers are brought up in organizations that reward compliance and predictability. They're not from our world. They are not risk takers. They don't deal with it well. They're used to predictable environment, and you always have to keep that in mind. It scares people. I talk to customers every day, and they tell me how much technology scares them. They tell, me, they tell me how much the unknown scares them. They tell me how much Windows 10 scares them. That, the latter one I can understand. And they don't understand it. So our job is to be that rock of certainty and reassurance to people to make sure they understand that they have someone they can go to because they want someone to listen to them. They want someone to be their friend. And one of the things I've found in general is that the information services department has not been that good at listening to customers. People don't want a service desk recording. They want to talk to somebody. They want someone to address their needs. They want someone to do it quickly, and they want someone that understands them and their job. They want relevant answers. 
They don't want pie in the sky. They want to know what they need to do. I'll tell you, most importantly, about four years ago, I was sitting in a meeting with executive team from a physician practice plan. I had about 30 executives around the table. And I had the CIO, who was my boss, tell me, okay, Mitch, this is great. Tell me what I need to do. And that was an eye-opener for me. I had a guy with 30-plus years IS experience who's been a CIO for over 20 of them ask me what to do, which led me to understand that what we do in security, a lot of people, a lot of we do in IS, a lot of people don't understand them when the CIO doesn't understand, we have to address those issues. So part of what we do, we do a risk assessment of our organization, and we take a look at what our top risks are as part of the risk assessment and address them. And we talk about actual incidents, and we also anonymize them and put them in the training program. So in other words, when I get up there, and I'm not talking to a room like this, I'm talking to a room of 200 plus people of doctors and executives in suits talking about what I'm doing, it hits them when I say, I'm here because this training is based on real world incidents that have happened in your organization to your people, and we don't want them happening again. That gets attention. And we take a look at our instruments constantly. We take a look at the questions that people fail. You want to get attention of the C-suite of an organization? Get up on stage, tell your assembled leadership team that you put a little ringer of a question about accessing the HR portal and how 50% of your people didn't know the website address for it. That gets attention. And I will tell you what happened afterwards is I had some executives come up to me and make comments about, you're doing analytics no one else is doing. And, this is, and they were very happy that we were because we came right out and goes, this is the problem. This is what we have to address. This is why it's a problem. We had 5,000 uh, 5, people that took this question, 2,500 failed. You have 7,000 employees. That's not good. So this is how we communicate security and privacy without making people's eyes glaze over. So people that have worked for me in the past know I talk a lot about MIGO, my eyes glaze over. And I use that all the time. Some of the people that work for me will tell me I probably use it too much. But what we do, we come to people, we come to their location whenever possible. We wear the brand, we keep our training short, we keep it relevant, and we give them opportunities to participate. So, brings me to another point. Customers know a lot more about security than we give them credit for, especially about emerging technology. So, a lot of people who know me know I talk a lot about blockchain. Why do I talk about it? Because I gave a guest lecture at IUPUI last year to a medical informatics class, and I had a pharmacist from Methodist Hospital start asking questions about it. When I had three vendors reach out to me, say, we're talking about it with your organization, we got real competent real quick. And when I originally presented all the work we did on blockchain at our director's meeting, our directors knew about it especially the ones that spend most of their time dealing with the clinical teams, like our, like our pharmacy IS team. So we had to get competent because they were researching this on their own. They were asking us questions, and we didn't want to sit there and poo-poo it. And I'm sorry, what's been a, what I've seen a lot of in security is people researching key emerging technologies and the security teams ignoring them. And it's to our detriment that this is happening. And if you listen to them, they'll tell you what they think. And they'll tell you what they don't like. And if you give them an hour, they'll give you an hour of what they don't like. And it's happened to every organization I've worked in, and it's our job to address it. And a lot of them bypass security because it gets in their way. I have, I have never worked for an organization that has willingly accepted security 100%. They will always find a bypass, and they will be smart about it. Favorite experiences, last job I had, I locked down the internet on all the nurse stations and all the wireless carts at a major academic health center. And the first thing I saw in the logs was a medical resident trying to access hidemyass.com to bypass our internet block. I thought that was one of the funniest things 
within like three days of us putting up this block on several thousand computers, I had, re I had people trying to bypass our blocks. And I had some that actually figured out how to bypass the blocks. We were doing physical security checks every quarter or so. I went to one of them and found a wireless cart that had Yahoo on it because somebody figured out some backdoor key sequence to get the Intel wireless utility up to change to the university wireless so they could access stuff on the internet. This is what we see. They will willingly bypass. And they know that it's hard to reach us. And again, bring back tactical core, they'll ignore what doesn't matter. And I consider social media to be even worse. Facebook, I consider to be the devil because it is the purveyor of snake oil for security. And it has replaced the ubiquitous mail, e mass emails people used to send out telling them, to telling them to delete Microsoft Java I used to get 15 years ago as the conveyor belt of bad ideas right into people's minds. And again, I can't say it enough. I think Taboola and Outbrain are just as bad, if not worse, than Facebook because they've been putting a lot of ads up lately talking about computing and Wi-Fi enhancements. So did you know you plug this little box in, your Wi-Fi and internet will be four times faster? Problem is, people are buying this stuff by the millions. And what's happening is these ads appear on major sites, and it makes them look credible when they're not. Because you'll have people going, you going, it was on CNN, it was on Bloomberg, it was on the Washington Post. It's not credible. But people are doing it anyway because it appears there. And also, you never underestimate the power of someone's friends and family when people are in crisis. Because, again, it comes back. People don't think well in uncertain situations, and a lot of scam artists take advantage of this. So I always go back to the example. Remember all the fake Windows pop-ups and fake antivirus that came out like five years ago? You know it was basically one guy? A guy by the name of Shalesh Kumar Jain? Better known as a guy that tried to buy somethingawful.com and a bunch of other sites and scammed a bunch of people and fled to Ukraine and I believe now Russia. He made over a hundred million dollars off of those fake antivirus ads and the Justice Department can't touch him because like Edward Snowden and various other people, he's sitting in Russia and Putin won't let him touch him. So never underestimate the power of someone's friends, family or Facebook or scam ads. So, how do you relate and combat to this? This is what I spend a lot of time on every month when I agonize on putting that monthly communication together for our workforce. We have to know our customers, and again, I'm gonna make a statement of fact. People go to Facebook because they trust it more than information systems. And a lot of what I learned, I did a listening tour at my last job, talking to the medical records staff most of whom made about $10 an hour and lived in a horrible, horrible neighborhood in Philadelphia because they couldn't afford to live anywhere else. But these people had computers, these people had high-speed internet, and they had computing and security problems. And when you're asking somebody who makes $10 to $15 an hour and has two kids living in North Philly what they do about computing problems, you know what they do most of the time? They throw out the computer, save up 50 bucks, go to the local Craigslist reseller that sells them something with pirated windows and buy something new. No privacy, no security. So I ended up aiming a bunch of my training at my last job about how to download and put free antivirus on computers. So the reason I did it is because I could not ask my customers who had no money and who were most likely accessing remote access services on my network using their computers to spend, six, to spend $79 a year on antivirus that they didn't have the money for. And I wanted to give them a reasonable degree of protection. And also, I understand that 50 bucks is coming from someone's pay. That's coming. That goes a long way to feeding a family or giving kids clothes. So... I did a lot with free antivirus and free computer security tips at my last job because people had families and no money. And I wanted to also keep it so people, people had little time for technology and keep things short. But again, I always harp back on this. 
Security training needs, you need to understand your customers and you need to understand their economic situation. A lot of people don't have money and quite frankly, a lot more people don't have money. And understand that when they buy that computer for Christmas, they're not going to spend that much money for the rest of the year. They're not going to have time to spend money for all those extra things. So you've got to make every cent of theirs count and you've got to take them into consideration because if you do, they're going to take you into consideration. So big thing we do that's something that's a little bit different than a lot of other organizations that I've learned from all my years in doing being a CISO is you need good leadership communication. You need to focus on your mission, talk about your purpose and risks, Use statistics to demonstrate why you're doing it. Talk about why and discuss what the risks you're fixing. You also got to make sure you give them talking points. Management loves talking points. Give them someone to contact with questions. Usually, it's me. And if you don't do this kind of stuff, your service desk gets the brunt of it, and they will scream at you. They will hate you if you do not do this. And you have to answer the questions. You have to be prompt. And when you do a major rollout, if you don't have people monitoring social media or monitoring your Q&A, you're going to be dead in the water. You have to do it because you're going to uncover issues when you do it. Talk to people. Meet with them. Talk about addressing their needs. So I'm going to go a little bit different and talk a little bit about management and senior leadership and their motivations. So I'm going to give you the whistle-stop tour of how senior management operates in, a in any large company. They're concerned about workflow and processes. They don't care any, about anything outside their world. And this could be a major concern later. They only care about what's under their purview. And their time to address their patients or customers is absolutely critical because that's what they're measured on. They're concerned with their budgets and they're concerned with their additional workload. And realistically, they will disobey orders if they feel it affects their ability to deliver solutions. And again, a lot of the name of management, name of the game is cover your ass. I'm going to come right out and be very direct about it. That's how they operate. And they will have no problem throwing you under the bus if you do something that they feel affects them. I had a manager at my last job who, after I fixed a redundant web server for her, because her primary web server was down for a couple of hours, proceeded to write a two-and-a-half-page letter to the CIO talking about what a risk I was to the organization, completely throwing me under the bus. Boss calls me into the room, goes, Mitch, I need you to see this. Sits me down, and I close the door. And I'm glad he did because the entire IT department would have seen the mushroom cloud coming out of my head. This was someone that had been to our wedding. And that is a lesson. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And you have to be prepared for it. Be prepared. They want to look good for senior leadership. That's why. And again, I learned a very important lesson also from somebody who did, I did telecommunications with in the past. It's not the, the C-suite. It's the one level down that worries them. And this is a constant issue in any company because management will override their own management if they, if they disagree with something. I've seen this across the board in anything you can think of with information systems because they, they are so focused, they want to get things done their way. And if team members did it, those team members would be fired. But there are a lot of cavalry egos in management because they are all jostling for that next position up. It is literally the filet of loyalty of a, of a snake pit. So when you talk to senior leadership, it's a lot better, though, because they're concerned about meeting their organizational risk goals, talking to the leadership teams, and addressing concerns of propagating changes, understanding statistics and reasons why they're doing this, and discussing how they got there. So when I talk to senior leadership, I talk about risk assessments, the incidents, talk about Q&A incident and percentages. But I'll sit there, and first slide's going to be, Here's the risk assessment we did. Here's the scores. Here's the federal laws. Here's what we want to do. Here's why. And more importantly, who we talked to to help prepare this presentation. I'll get more to it. So context I'm going to talk about. Most members of senior or C-suite leadership in companies 
our ex big four consultants or top level management consultants from McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, you, your various bespoke consulting groups, or they're ex government employees, or they're from really good companies with great leadership development programs such as GE or IBM. Yes, even though IBM's fired a bunch of people, I still put them there. But they come from top level executive training programs. Most of these people have been scouted out for C suite positions since they were in college. I am not exaggerating when I say this, and I'll get into this later. You gotta be on the top of your game when dealing with these people and talking about the whys. And any time you put anything together for the C-suite executive, multiple editors and reviewers. Last one of these I put together had 10. Usually I do five, but because of a certain executive it went to, it was 10. Because I will tell you something, Year and a half ago, I gave a presentation, talked about the risks, talked about what we needed to do. The first question out of a very senior executive's mouth was, did so-and-so review this? And the answer I gave them was, yes, they've had this presentation for a week. Another very senior executive piped up. I was going to ask that question, too. Thank you for answering. So... Everything we're talking about here, when you put this kind of presentation together, talk about what you're doing in leadership and training, this is critically important because you need to get their full buy-in because what's going to happen is people are going to push back and they need to be reminded why they're doing it. So part of what I do when we put out a huge new initiative like this is a gigantic listening tour. We talk to everybody and it is a long list. I don't care what organization you work for, if you don't talk to your stakeholders and talk about what you're doing with training and why, it'll get pulled back. And you've got to give them talking points. Give them someone for questions. I can't emphasize this enough. Yes, I repeated this. And the reason why is because service desks can be your friend, but if you don't do this, and you don't give the service desk someone to talk to, they will be your worst enemy. And you don't want the people that are taking the frontline phone calls to be your worst enemy because that leads to discontent and people hating your guts and, secure, and your next security initiative failing. So you got to deliver things and keep them short and sweet. Use video whenever you possibly can. And use every organizational channel you can get your hands on to report what you're doing. Even the ones you don't think you need get a hold of. Talk to anyone you possibly can. So when I did my training at my last job at Temple Health, I did annual information security training. I had a dozen reviewers that, that the training went out to. I would start work two months before go live with the updated training instruments. And I had everyone across the board. My best reviewer was a chief nurse, chief nurse at Fox Chase Cancer Center, Ann Jadwin because she's the only one that would look at the instrument questions and ask if they made sense or not. I had CIOs on that list. I had directors. I had people in regulatory. Heck, I think I even mean, had a couple doctors on there, but the nurse gave the best answers. And if I have a big security initiative to put out there, you bet your bottom dollar the first people I'm going to go to are nursing, because it's the only way it's going to succeed. Because if the training doesn't succeed, it'll get derailed. And I'll be honest, if I don't get buy-in from nursing, I don't even tell my boss. That's how serious I take nursing in my organization. And again, you're not going to address everything. So when your customers put out new products, ask what they're doing about training. Ask about the security component. Because uncertainty is going to happen. Failure is going to happen. And joint commission happens. I should have substituted that in instead of the asterisk expletives. You're not going to be comprehensive, and that's why you have to have that two-way communication and give people an easy way to contact you and give credit to people that make contributions. So a little bit of a side here. We've had some security incidents where we've had to contact other institutions. I have had to use LinkedIn. I have had to use Facebook. I have had to use other forms of social media. In some cases, I've actually called hospital switchboards to track down the security people because I can't find who they are. So what's the RFC number for security.txt? Whatever it is, 
make it a priority. And in your organization, make it a priority to make sure people know who you are because they will call you. You want them calling you because they're going to tell you things that you don't, you're not aware of. And you have to have it in your projects. Every project needs a training plan. Every security project has to have a training plan. And you have to address this, period. And what's going to end up happening? You're going to end up writing a lot of this stuff for your team. Because, again, when it comes to computer security issues, no one writes as well as a really good security person. So I've kind of transitioned from being someone that used to love doing techie stuff a lot and someone that used to really do a lot of techie stuff to working more with corporate communications than our infrastructure team on writing things on at least a monthly basis for multiple resources in the organization and multiple avenues. Corporate communications is your best friend. And I will tell you why. It's a two-way street. There's a lot of fear-mongering reporters out there that un don't understand technology, but yet work for major national press agencies. You want corporate communications calling you when someone proposes something that's so outlandish or fear-inducing that the sheer thought of it going out in the national press should give you shivers. You want that relationship because you want to make sure stuff like that never gets published. So they are your best friends. You need to have that project plan. You need to have that monthly communication plan. And you need corporate communications helping you open up avenues. You need, that, you need medical informatics and nursing and clinical informatics, everyone in your area opening up avenues and their corporate newsletters. So you get in there and talk about what's going on. And obviously, the other reason you do it is for emergency communications. Because there's always going to be an, an, yet another vulnerability we have to warn about or the one ring scams, or robocalls, or Black Friday scams. Because again, there, if you don't have those means, you're going to have an issue. And I bring it back to emergency management. Another funny story I like to tell. About nine years ago, there were massive blizzards in the Philadelphia area. We're talking within, two, within a week, 50 inches of snow fell. It was almost like, it was almost like living in Minnesota except with a much better hockey team, except Minnesota's got a much better hockey team. But what happened is that I had a CEO on stage sitting there talking about, well, I want the communication here. I don't want it on the intranet. What I did is I directly disobeyed our, disobeyed our CEO. Called up the web development manager and said, I need you to put this on the intranet now. Keep putting it up there, keep updating it every night. It was the emergency status. What happened is when they did the, what they call hot wash, and they, in other words, the lessons learned from the snow emergency, the number one item that people remarked on in terms of how we communicated to the workforce was that it was easily available on the patient portal, on the portal, and they could see it. By the time I left that organization, we had six different applications rigged up so that when an emergency alert went out, it was on the application itself. So people didn't have to go looking five different places. They'd be in the middle of doing something, the alert would pop up with the application they were using. And almost every major electronic medical record can be configured to do it. We know because we did it. So brings me to my last big point as part of doing this. You have to be the leader you wish you had. We have some major issues in security, and the big ones I talk about are bad attitudes, egotism, and unfortunately, the people that those are attached to. And security is a different world. We think about exploring, deconstructing, and reverse engineering versus constructing and risk aversion. And a lot of the people in the top positions, we didn't go through the same vetting and predictable processes that the other management level positions go through. I hinted at the fact that most people that are in the C-suite positions, they started vetting for those in college. I am going to explain to you how they do it. The proper name for human resources, according to Dr. Jim Smither of LaSalle University, who teaches the wonderful Human Resources Management 760 course that all people in human resources leadership 
have to take before they get the job. Not that particular course at LaSalle, but others. The proper name for human resources is Applied Industrial and Organizational Psychology. I believe Dr. Smither because he's written several books on the subject and is, happens to be one of the world's most foremost experts in leadership developments. And a lot of the top managers out there, they have been through psychological instruments and evaluations very few other people have been through. There is a class of psychologists called a psychosometrician that developed the quantitative evaluation tests used to determine whether someone is fit for leadership or top managements. They all have PhDs. There are actually less psychosometricians than some disciplines of surgeon in the US. The big other reason I know about this, I worked for one. He told me, this is how things are done. You are dealing through people, you're dealing with senior leadership that has been through a level of scrutiny to get to the positions they're at, that unless you work for a three-letter agency, you will not get that level of scrutiny. Unless you work for the NSA, CIA, or one of the intelligence agencies whose name, whose, whose name shall not be spoken about, you haven't gotten this. Most people in management haven't even been through that level of psychological scrutiny, which is why a lot of them are still in management and aren't going to move up to senior management. And we have a lot of leaders in security that haven't been vetted for these positions and psychological traits. We haven't been through this path. We haven't been through the same training, development, or programs. And let me tell you something. MBA is only part of it, and they make you aware. It is a process designed to find people and put them in their positions starting when they're about 18 years old. And I'd say even further back, if you believe some, if you realistically take a look at what they look at what you did in high school to even get you in some of those colleges in the first place. Everything is designed through a series of quantitative tests to determine who's right to be in the C-suites. People that have made them in security, again, a lot of the people out there are there because they've worked harder and better than everybody else and worked against this system to the point where leadership took notice and did something about it. That's how. A lot of people in CISO positions, they didn't get there because they were top of their class and were at some big four consulting firm. No, they got there because they, quite frankly, outworked everyone else. So brings me to a big issue in security. We don't have to act like it and keep others away, and I think that's a major problem a lot of, we see a lot of in security. So again, training and education are not about buying content and slapping up slides or just buying some product. You gotta build up those good relationships and communication. Evaluate your risks and incidents and results from your previous training before you go develop new stuff. And Understand and realize we haven't been through the same processes and programs that other top leadership has gone through. We, and we talked about these differences and how, we, and how we can address them. And again, you gotta think like your customers. And that's why I brought it up. Might have seemed a little bit disjointed. You have to think like your customers in order to better serve your customers. And especially with management and their tendencies to CYA and throw people under the bus. And you got to build that program and keep it going so you can better educate your workforce. So with that, thank you all very much. And yes, you can follow me on Twitter. Have a great day, everyone.